Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, we'll now move to question time. Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. With energy bills up $500, even taking into account Labor's limited temporary payments, and the average family $25,000 worse off under this budget, hasn't Labor let Australia down by failing to deliver a budget that gets the cost of living down for all Australians? Thank you, Senator Hume. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank Senator Hume for the question and for the opportunity to talk about what a strong, responsible budget uh, we have handed down. And in, in answer to, to the figures that um, Senator Hume's re, uh, read out, well, I don't trust them on figures, right? Because I've just worked through this budget and all the dodgy budgeting that went into their years in government, the hidden funding cliffs the under-resourcing, the failing to account, a significant part of the investments that we are making in this budget is to deal with funding that just terminated and was never accounted for in their budget. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. President, interjections are disorderly. Senator Watt was interjecting from the moment the question was asked. I would ask if you could bring him into order. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. I'm very glad that you um, noted that interjections are disorderly because there were interjections across the chamber. I will remind all senators that interjections are disorderly, as Senator Henderson has reminded everyone. And when questions are asked and ministers are on their feet, I expect all senators in this place to respect the silence that's required. Minister. This budget takes pressure off families while not adding to pressure on inflation. We have taken our job in finely and carefully calibrating this budget so that we don't add to inflation, but that we are able to provide sensible cost of living relief to those that need that support the most, while still at the same time making historic investments yeah, yeah. in bulk billing in Medicare, tripling the Medicare bulk billing incentive yeah. to make it easier for parents of children for concession card holders, for pensioners, to ensure that when they need to see a doctor, that they get that consultation bulk billed. Yeah. That's what you get under a Labor government. Not dodgy budgeting and failing to account, but fiscal discipline, investments where they need to be made, cleaning up the mess of nine years of your administration, putting the budget on a more sustainable, more resilient footing so that we can make room for the things that we know Australians depend on and expect from their government. That is the approach that we took in this budget. I am very proud of this budget, very proud indeed, because we have had to balance up a range of competing pressures to land a document that is right for the current economic challenges and circumstances we face. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hume, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Why has the government removed the objective to tackle inflation from the federal budget papers? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Order. Did you get past the glossy, Senator Hume? <laughs> right. OK. It's run throughout Order. all of the budget papers. It was in the Treasurer's speech to the parliament when the budget was introduced last night. It's in budget. It, it, it is filtered through every single uh, Senator, document. Uh, Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. I'm asking for order across the chamber once again. Order on my left and my right, Minister. The, the Treasurer and I have been talking about the inflation challenge since we came to government. The, the, my, the, the largest, Senator Hume. The, the, the largest increase in inflation actually happened in the March quarter of last year under your administration, where you poured $8.6 billion into the economy in six months. Now, that wasn't inflationary then, according to you. We have got a very carefully calibrated budget that looks to repair the budget over time, put it on a more sustainable footing, make the investments we need and ensure that we can support those people that are doing it really tough across the country. Uh, thank you, Minister. 
Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. After three quarters of inflation with a seven in front of it, why did the government deliver a budget with $185 billion increased spending that will add to inflationary pressures? And as Chris Richardson, S&P, Goldman Sachs and UBS have all said, will force the RBA to raise interest rates. Thank you, Senator Hume. Um, Minister. Well, I don't accept the numbers that Senator Hume has, has used in her question for a start. I don't know where they came from and I don't know who got the calculator operating on the opposition's Order. benches to come up with that Order. figure. But I, what I would say uh, is we've taken our advice from the Treasury. You see the inflation forecasts in the budget papers if you get to that point in Budget Paper 1. Uh, you can see what, what uh, the Treasury, who advises us, uh, is actually saying about this budget and its impact on inflation. 6 per 6 in the 22-23 year, declining to 3.25 per cent next year and declining back into the target range in the year after that. Let's, let's go with what the budget books say. Hey? Order. And in terms of, of economists, yes, you will get a range of views from economists. I just sat next to one at a lunch where they said their view was the budget was neutral. The budget was neutral. And in fact, that's what a lot of the major banks are saying. At worst case, it's neutral. So I think you know there will be opinions, but Thank we are Minister. very confident the time with what we are doing. Has expired, Senator Payman. Order. Uh, Senator Payman, please resume your, your seat. Order on my left. Senator Payman. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister update the Senate on the budget that the Treasurer delivered last night and how it delivers for all Australians? Good question. Thank you, Senator Payman. Minister. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Payman for uh, that question. I appreciate it. Uh, the budget the Treasurer delivered last night does many things. It responded to the immediate challenges and set Australia up for the future, as well as forecasting a surplus and providing relief for the most vulnerable. Helping the vulnerable and delivering a forecasted surplus aren't really experiences familiar to the coalition, are they? They never managed it during their nine whole years in government. They got the mugs printed, but they didn't actually deliver it. And we remember all the photos. We remember all the photos. Nine years of financial mismanagement, nine years of bad budgeting, gaps in the budget, fiscal cliffs, booby traps that have taken us two budgets to uncover. We have inherited it all and we have dug the budget out of that hole in order to deliver a forecasted surplus. We have cleaned up the mess left behind. We have managed to deliver for Australians, particularly those who need it the most, and those that had been left behind uh, uh, under the former government. The budget brings stronger, builds stronger foundations for a better future by delivering cost of living relief that does not drive up inflation a historic $5.7 billion investment to strengthen Medicare, investing in a strong and more secure economy through significant investments in renewable energy, skills and to modernise and grow Australia's industrial capabilities and, of course, broadening opportunity, President, including advancing women's economic opportunity. We don't see women as an add-on, as something that you look at once you've finalised the budget. Women have been front and central of our decision-making, and we are absolutely determined to ensure we seize the economic opportunities that come from a country that treats women equally. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payment, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, can the Minister outline how the government's responsible economic management allows it to make significant investments in Medicare to benefit all Australians? Minister. Thank you, President. And I can, Senator Payman. Thank you very much for the question. And I think this has been a very key part of this budget, is how, with the upgrades to revenue, how much we have uh, provide, uh, put back to budget repair. 87 per cent over the last two budgets in revenue upgrades to the budget, compared to about 40 per cent under the previous administration. This shows how serious we are around fiscal repair, about ensuring that we don't have to be uh, avoiding borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars in debt and then paying the interest on that debt. And to do so, we have ensured that we are putting the budget on a more sustainable footing, which allows you to make critical investments in things like Medicare, things that people value, 
tripling the bulk billing incentive, putting a range of measures in place to ensure that people can have their health care needs looked after, including those with chronic disease. <coughs> In terms of the bulk billing incentive, 11.6 million Australians you, will Minister, benefit from that measure alone. Expired. Senator Payman, second supplementary. Thank God the adults are back in charge. Can the, oh, yeah. can the, minister, can the minister provide further information on how the government is delivering cost of living relief through its $14.6 billion in responsible and targeted cost of living relief? Thank you, Senator Payman. Minister Gallagher. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Payman. Thanks, President, for the call. The, uh, the cost of living package was, is, a, is a, a, a key part of the budget, and we've been clear as we've been dealing with the inflation challenge, accepting that we needed to provide targeted and calibrated cost of living relief uh, across the forward estimates, and we have targeted that, targeted that carefully. So the $14.6 billion cost of living package over four years allows us to make those investments into energy bill relief uh, for five million households and one million small businesses, which I will remind people that those opposite voted against in December when we recalled the parliament, the more affordable health care, cheaper medicines and support for those who need it most, including extending parenting payments single for parent, single parents who have children between the ages of eight and 14. $4.9 billion to increase the rate of eligible working age and student payments, which will benefit 1.1 million Australians, the largest increase Thank to you, Commonwealth Minister, rent assistance in 30 expired. years. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Is it the government's assessment that Labor's budget makes future interest rate increases more likely or less likely? Is fiscal policy working complementary to monetary policy. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we have been very clear uh, in the lead up to the budget and in the decisions taken, which are outlined in the budget paper, uh, that we uh, see that as dealing with the inflation challenge in the economy is a priority. Uh, as to decisions that the Reserve Bank may make, we don't well, foreshadow those, and we don't we we leave that. For the independent bank itself makes those decisions. We, we, never, we, never, we never try and get ahead and say what we think they should do, what we think their decisions would, will be. They are independent of government for important reasons, and I think that was something that the opposition uh, has previously accepted. In terms of the, in terms of, in terms of the inflation forecast, well, I'm trying to answer your question, Senator Birmingham. If you stop peppering me, um, well. In terms, in terms of the inflation forecast, you can see them in the budget. You can see them in the budget. Um, they're outlined in the budget, the forecast. You can see that when it comes to energy bill relief, the package that you voted against, uh, the caps that you voted against, the relief that you voted against. Right. When it comes to that, that actually has a downward uh, pressure on inflation of three quarters of a per cent. And that the other measures that we are taking, carefully calibrated over four years, do not have a negative impact on inflation. That is the advice the government Senator has. Hume. That is re represented in the budget papers. It might be an uncomfortable truth for those opposite that you actually find a government that actually wants to do a number of things in the budget, that actually wants to show a bit of compassion and deal with some of the pressures that people are feeling and be responsible about how we manage the budget. I think that is probably a foreign concept to you, so I can see how it is challenging you. But we are able, with the approach we've taken to this budget, with returning money back to budget, with cleaning up the mess, with making investments and, and making sure they're carefully targeted not to add to inflation. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just a moment, Senator Birmingham. Senator Hume, your interjections, your constant interjections are disorderly. I'd ask you to stop. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, uh, thanks President. Uh, Minister, contrary to your claims, the Financial Review has reported that, quote, extra spending is not offset by meaningful cuts to neutralise the fiscal pulse. Economist Chris Richardson said of the budget, I had thought the Reserve Bank was done and dusted, Senator but this Watt. has notably raised the chance that they will do another swing of the baseball bat. Given that the Minister is unable to say that future interest rate, in rate increases are less likely as a result of Labor's budget, aren't you acknowledging that the Albanese government's fiscal policy settings do not put downward pressure on interest rates? 
Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister Gallagher. Uh, President, <coughs> it is, uh, it is sort of amusing to me that Senator Birmingham is able to ask that question with a straight face, to be honest, after the work that I've done having to clean up the mess of the previous administration, including, including finding $40 billion in savings. $40 billion in savings in two budgets, Minister and what happened in your last Minister, budget? Please resume your seat. Order on my left. Or, Senator Payne, I've just called the chamber to order. Minister. $40 billion in savings that we have identified in just two budgets, less than a year, when in the March uh, budget, uh, zero. Minister, please resume zero. your seat. Senator Hughes. Thank you. A point of order. The minister is misleading the Senate. Offsets uh, and saves are very different things. Not, yeah. Are they saves or are they offsets? Minister, are they saves or are they Senator offsets? Hume. No. Senator Hume, that is a debating point. Minister Gallagher. $40 billion in savings, zero in the March budget. Zero. You poured cash in in a pre election cash splash and zero savings. And part of the saving, part of the spending that we are doing in this financial year is to keep the lights on, the agencies and services that you were going to flick off. That's a, that is a single that eleven and a half billion dollars that we have had to make room for, find unexpected, didn't know it was going to happen, in order to keep services going. That's Thank the you, legacy Minister. of your the time government. time for answering has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thanks, President. I refer the minister to the remarks of Better Shares chief economist, who said the spending in this budget is quote unambiguously expansionary and risks one, if not two, additional interest rate increases. Or Goldman Sachs, who say the budget has created a hawkish outlook for monetary Senator policy, Watt. risking more interest rate rises. Or UBS, who say the budget shows an increasing risk of further rate hikes. Are all of these experts wrong about the Albanese government's budget? when they say it will put more pressure on the Reserve Bank to keep interest rates higher for longer. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I've said in previous answers, the decisions we took in this budget were to ensure that the spending where we had to spend and where we needed to spend, including in targeted calibrated cost of living relief for vulnerable households in this country, that we did it in a way that didn't add to inflation. That is the advice from Treasury. That is what you'll see if you make it past the glossy in the budget papers, and I suggest you read it. And no doubt we will go through this in estimates. Well, I have had a number of discussions. I, I presume you selectively quote Senator Birmingham with due respect. I have had a number of conversations, and indeed there are a number of opinions in, across, econ, across the economic field, across economists. What a surprise that is. In the ones that I've just had this morning, their view is, it, it, in the worst scenario, it's neutral. That is the assessment of some. You choose to uh, selectively quote others. So be it. We're in. We're in a contest here. I understand. Uh, thank that. you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, last night's budget left people in poverty. People who are struggling to survive on <laughs> Centrelink <laughs> poverty payments have criticised the budget for leaving them in dire straits, and they've been backed in by organisations like ACOS, the Anti Poverty Centre, the Tomorrow Movement, and the National Union of Students. The Business Council of Australia said this morning that we have to lift job seeker to 90 per cent of the age pension over time. Your hand-picked Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee recommended an increase in job seeker and other payments more than six times what the government delivered last night. When will you listen to this advice and raise the rate of job seeker and other income support payments to above the poverty line? Thank you, Senator Wright. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank Senator Rice for the question. And it's an important question, but I would also say that welcome to the Senate. We have questions here. We're doing too much, and we're fueling inflation. And we have <laughs> questions here, which are saying you're not doing enough, and you should triple or indeed uh, progress it more than that. I mean, I think that makes the point the Treasurer and I have been trying to make for some time: is that this this budget has been balancing up a range of decisions. Senator Rustin based on the economic circumstances of the time. We have high inflation. Our spending has to be calibrated, it has to be careful and it has to be targeted. 
And so when you look at the work that we've done in just this budget, or even if you attach it to the October budget, to look at what we've been doing, making gradual and pro gradual progress towards addressing some of the needs uh, that have been left to us by those opposites' failure to deliver, and some of uh, the work that we know needs to be done because we're Labor people. And you'll see that in this budget. You'll see it in the childcare investments. You'll see it in the cheaper medicines. You see it in the Medicare. You see it in the investment in skills. You see it in the growth side of the budget. And you'll see it on the compassion side of the budget in relation to uh, social security and payments. A significant uptick for single parent parenting payments. Significant. An increase to the base rate of job seeker. An increase for the, the most significant increase to Commonwealth rent assistance seen. All of this working together to make sure that for those who do need an extra helping hand, we are giving them an extra helping hand. These have been difficult decisions to land. Some say it's too much, others say it's not enough. But I think you can see the genuineness with the approach that the Albanese government has taken. When we said we would assess payments, we would do what we can to adjust them in every budget, we've been doing that. We've been doing Thank that you, work. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Minister, as for your compassion, last night's budget gave people living below the poverty line an increase of just $2.85 a day, which won't even cover the cost of a loaf of bread. But it gave billionaires and politicians almost 10 times more, with the stage three tax cuts giving every one of us here $25 a day or $9,000 a year. Why do us politicians need $9,000 a year in tax cuts while job seekers are left on poverty payments? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I would, again, to Senator Rice, uh, say that the, the cost of living package, which is targeted and was carefully calibrated so as to be affordable and sustainable going forward, not add to inflation, but also see it in the context of a range of other me measures. The energy bill relief, for example, the efforts that we're putting in for cheaper medicines, the efforts we're putting into urgent care centres and bulk billing rates so that people on payments can actually access bulk billing health care. We know that that's a problem. So I don't think you should see one payment in isolation of all of the other work that's been done in this budget. On top of that, we've found $4 billion for the community sector indexation, providing services to people, many of whom are on payments. $4 billion. Do you think that mob would have ever done that? Never. I mean, these are the difficult decisions we've taken. It's carefully calibrated Thank and you, it's the Minister, right thing the to do. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Um, last night's budget sets out a $4 billion surplus. You can't eat a surplus. Why have a surplus when you've still got too many Australians living in tents and cars, <laughs> trying to survive on one meal a day and not able to afford critical medications? Order on my right. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, being in government means you have to do a range of things. One of them is repair the budget. We have to repair the budget so that we can ensure that as needs grow, and we know they are growing, as pressures on the budget increase, we have room to meet those pressures, be it in climate policy, be it in social services, be it in investments in women, be it in investments in housing. All of those pressures are going to have to be met. So we have to get the budget on a better footing. We have also avoided borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars to pay for our services, avoiding interest payments on that debt, which again makes a difference to find room and create room for those people that we want to invest in and for those programs we want to invest in. In terms of this year, when the payments come in, in it, sorry, in the next financial year when the payments come in, there is a deficit. The budget is in deficit in three of the in four of the forward estimates years. And so budget repair remains a challenge. Finding room to do good things for Thank good you, people Minister, is also a priority. Has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Don Farrell. Oh, sorry, Senator Farrell. <laughs> uh, Minister Farrell, indeed. When, 
Minister, we know that Labor created the welfare system and has been a champion of strengthening Australia's social security safety net. Can the minister outline how the Albanese Labor government is continuing to strengthen the safety net through measures in the budget to support Australians doing it tough? Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, minister Farrell. Thank you. Thank you, President. And can I thank uh, Senator uh, Smith for her uh, question and the great job that she's uh, doing for the people of South Australia? And I can answer her question. Um, this government, but particularly that terrific uh, Minister uh, Rishworth, understands that many Australians are doing it tough. We know that households are feeling the pinch as a result of cost of living pressures. That's why we set through this budget to address these pressures, providing responsible, targeted relief as the number one priority in our budget. As the Treasurer announced last night, our $14.6 billion cost of living plan includes help with power bills, record investment in uh, Medicare bulk billing and cheaper medicines. We're also increasing working age and student payment rates and Commonwealth rent assistance. These increases are responsible and targeted to help vulnerable people to strengthen the social safety net. Rates of job seeker, youth allowance, partnered parenting payments, Oz study, AB study, Youth disability support pension and special benefits will rise by $40 a fortnight. This will benefit around 1.1 million Australians. We're also expanding eligibility for the existing higher rate of job seeker to single recipients aged 55 and over who have been on income support for nine, months, uh, nine or more continuous months, which currently applies from age 60. We will provide additional support for renters with the largest increase to Commonwealth rent assistance in more than 30 years. Yes, 30 years. Budget will increase the maximum rates for the, of this payment by 15 per cent. Combined, these changes provide additional support to around 2 million people. They provide responsible, balanced support to those who need Thank it you, most. Thank you, Minister Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and uh, please feel free to call me Marielle. Um, <laughs> We know, Minister, that single parents in our community are doing it really tough. They're doing one of the most challenging but rewarding jobs all on their own, raising their children. How is the Albanese Labor government showing our support for single parents and older Australians by strengthening Australia's social security safety net? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Smith, for your first uh, supplementary question. Uh, and I can answer that question because single parents uh, are the family type most likely to experience financial hardship. It can be tough for these parents, who are overwhelmingly women, to balance caring responsibility and full-time work, studying or looking for work. This doesn't end when the child turns eight. With the government's changes announced in the budget, which expand eligibility for single parenting payments to parents with the youngest child under 14. More than 57,000 single parents will be better off by at least $176.90 per fortnight. Similarly, we know that older Australians face barriers uh, when they are looking for work. Our changes expand access to existing uh, higher rates of job seeker for those on payments of nine months or more uh, or those over 55. This acknowledges their circumstances and provides greater financial support while they look for work. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Minister, how will young people benefit through the strengthening of Australia's social security safety net? Minister Parrish. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Smith, for that second uh, supplementary question. And I know this is a group of people you have uh, very deep interest in. And our government understands the unique challenge that young Australians are facing, and we want to ensure that young people are set up to succeed. Students and young people will benefit from Labor's changes to payment rates, with 318,000 young people on income support, including those on youth allowance receiving an additional $40 per fortnight. Many students and young people will also benefit from the government's increases to Commonwealth rent assistance. For those who already receive the maximum amount, uh, their payment will increase by 15 per cent. Uh, and this is a vast majority of students and young people 
who receive rent assistance. For example, a 20-year-old student on youth allowance who rents with flatmates and receives the maximum rate can receive more than an additional $55 per fortnight. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. Does the Albanese Labor government acknowledge the fact that many Australian men are victims of domestic and family violence? Minister Farrell? Yes. Uh, Senator Hanson, first supplementary. What actual physical, financial or legal support is the Albanese Labor government providing to men who are victims of domestic and family violence? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Hanson for her, uh, her question. Uh, well, the, uh, the government uh, takes uh, the issue of uh, domestic uh, violence uh, extremely seriously and, uh, of course, uh, as part of uh, all of the things that this uh, government is doing in the, in the uh, social security space, um, we're ensuring that the issue uh, of domestic violence is front of mind and one of those issues which um, uh, ensures that, uh, as a government, we seek to address, uh, address this issue. Um, we don't seek to sweep the issue under the carpet. We acknowledge the seriousness um, of the issue. Uh, and uh, in every way that we can, through a range of uh, uh, projects, uh, we seek to try and uh, deal with the issue. Um, it's a serious social issue. It's uh, an issue uh, that affects uh, so many— Oh, sorry, uh, Senator Farrell. Uh, it's time. Um, Senator Hanson. Second supplementary. didn't ask the question. Maybe you could answer this one. Statistics show that while a woman dies every six days due to domestic homicide in Australia, a man dies every eight days due to domestic homicide, with the main perpetrators being women. This week's budget includes an additional $326.7 million for women's safety, but none for men. Why is the Albanese Labor government not providing support and funding to adult male victims of domestic and family violence when men make up 25 per cent of all domestic violence victims? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Hanson. I thought I answered your first question very, very directly. I don't know if I could have answered it uh, any more directly, more directly than, uh, uh, than I did. Um, Look, the re re reality of the circumstances, and unfortunately, is that uh, women um, are for uh, w women and children are far more likely um, to be victims of do domestic uh, violence. Even the figures that you've just uh, read out to me um, demonstrate that uh, that fact. Um, um, look, we don't support domestic violence, whether it's against a man or a woman or a child. Um, and we seek to address that serious um, social and community issue by um, injecting funds into those um, communities to try and resolve and reduce the level of domestic. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the time for answering has expired. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, what is the contribution made by, the Australia, by Australia's resources sector, including coal and gas, to the bu budget bottom line? How much revenue does it contribute? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, I don't have the exact figures at my fingertips, but it is a significant contributor through company tax and through uh, other taxation arrangements. Um, I don't think anyone's pretending otherwise. Um, and in terms of the revenue upgrades uh, that we've seen and the very welcome revenue upgrades that we've seen to the uh, budget, of which uh, 87 per cent across the uh, last two budgets have been returned for budget repair, of, of that, um, about uh, 20 per cent is related uh, to the strong uh, prices that we're getting for commodities. Uh, I would say the other parts where there is significant contribution to the upward revision in revenue is because of the strong labour market, the low unemployment rate, the fact that more people are in jobs, which is absolutely fantastic, and that we're seeing for the first time in a decade 
the beginnings of some solid wages growth. Um, we've overturned the policy that the former government had of wage stagnation, um, determined and deliberate wage stagnation, uh, and we are seeing for the first time uh, good sustainable wages growth, which is good for working people in this country. Um, we expect Order. in that yes, we'll see real wages growth. We'll see real Order. wages growth as, as foreshadowed right, in the Mr. budget Gallagher, paper. Please. And that is contributing Mr. to Gallagher, the revenue please upgrades. Resume your seat. Order on my left. You have one of your senators on her feet. Senator Macdonald. Uh, just on relevance, perhaps the minister could take my question on notice if she doesn't have the answer. Thank you. Senator Macdonald, um, well, Minister Gallagher. Uh, well, I said that I didn't have the number for him. More than happy to find the exact number of how we break down uh, the receipts from company tax. Essentially, is what you're asking me to do to break it down into a subset of a particular industry. I'm happy to do that and, and come back to the chamber. The point I'm making, though is that whilst uh, that is a contributor to the revenue improvements that we're seeing in the budget and we, are, we welcome that, that there are other factors at play here. One is the fact that we are strongly uh, handling the economy and that we've got low, low um, unemployment and strong wages growth, which is also relevant Thank to you, the Minister budget Gallagher, bottom line. The time for answering has expired. Are you on your feet for first supplementary? Thank you. Minister, to what extent is the government relying on the continued success of Australia's resource sector, including coal and gas, to fund the additional spending in the budget? How much revenue do you assess is being generated by iron ore, by coal, by gas and by other parts of the mining sector? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, well, it, makes a, it, it certainly makes a significant contribution uh, to to receipts, but I, I don't think anyone has ever said otherwise. I don't think anyone has ever said otherwise. I mean, it was the same under the former government as it is under us. Uh, we've outlined some proposed changes around PRRT going forward, but we haven't made we haven't changed any of the uh, revenue. Uh, arrangements uh, that operated under the former government in relation to um, taxation of, of those companies that you talk about. Um, and I hope that with PRRT that we would have your support for those changes when they come through this. Oh. <sighs> Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Davey. Macdonald. Macdonald, sorry. That's right. Uh, again, on relevance, uh, if you don't have the answer here in the chamber, could I ask that you bring the specifics back, uh, please? Senator, uh, Senator Macdonald, the minister is being relevant. Thank you. Minister Gallagher. Not a point of order, exactly. Um, and I hope that when we bring the sensible, modest changes to PRRT that we've worked on um, together with the companies, with the relevant companies, that we would have the, the support of the opposition uh, in Minister making Gallagher, sure that those changes get through. Seat. Minister uh, Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Relevance, the specifics to my question, uh, please. Will the minister bring them back to the chamber? Uh, Senator Macdonald, you were on your feet a little few minutes beforehand, and I said I believe the minister was being relevant to the question. I believe the minister is still being relevant, and I'll listen carefully to the remainder of her answer. Minister Gallagher. Uh, the senator asked what contribution those companies make. I said it was significant. I've answered the question. Um, Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Minister, will you thank coal and gas communities in regional Australia whose success is providing over a million direct and indirect jobs, billions in taxes and royalties, and propping up Australia's economy? Will your government commit to supporting these industries rather than penalising them? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Gallagher. Um, well, I don't. I'm not trying to be negative, but um, you know we don't usually go around thanking people for abiding by the law. Um, you know, well, well, the budget uh, the budget relies on a whole range of, of um, revenue measures, uh, a whole range of re revenue measures across the board. I am very happy to thank across the board every part of the economy that That's contributes right. to uh, generating revenue that allows us to provide the services that we need to the Australian people. Um, Very Minister happy Gallagher, to do that. Please resume your seat. Order. Minister, please continue. Um, 
Well, I think I've answered the question. In terms of all the revenue that comes to the budget, I am deeply thankful as the Finance Minister. I can tell you, if we didn't have that revenue, then we would be in a very difficult position uh, about Minister ensuring we're funding. Please sir. resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. Just on relevance, I'm wondering if you can say coal and gas. Uh, uh, Senator Macdonald, that's not the Minister. Order on my order. Senator Watt. Senator Watt, Senator Watt, I am addressing a point of order. The minister is being relevant. Senator Macdonald, minister, please, uh, minister, please continue. Pleaded my answer, and I know what the game Senator Macdonald's trying to play and being divisive because it's a common tactic. I have already acknowledged the significant contribution that those industries play in generating revenue for the budget. I have done that, Senator Macdonald. I hope it makes you happy. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Watt. We are in a black deaths in custody crisis in this country. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody recommendations clearly outline the importance of Aboriginal legal services and the need for adequate funding for those as per recommendations 226G and 234. Instead, First Nations legal services are breaking under the demand they face, and some have had to shut down to cut their services due to underfunding. My question is, why aren't you funding Aboriginal legal services? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Thorpe, uh, for this important question. I guess the short answer, Senator Thorpe, is that we are funding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, and that's because we recognise the importance of funding those legal services as Aboriginal community controlled providers of culturally appropriate legal assistance services. Um, and as I think you're aware, the Attorney General himself has very extensive experience, including in his pre-parliament career in working with those legal services, so I know that he's a strong believer in them. Uh, in terms of the funding that we're providing, we are of course continuing funding that already existed under the National Legal Ass Assistance Partnership, uh, which lasts until 2025. Over the life of that agreement, that partnership provides over $440 million over five years in baseline funding for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services. Additionally, those legal services also receive over $11 million over five years in quarantined funding for the Justice Policy Partnership and expensive complex cases and coronial inquiries funding. Uh, there's additional funding that we're continuing outside of that partnership, uh, through, particularly through the National Indigenous Australians Agency, uh, which will, is providing over $48 million uh, to legal services over a five-year period. And in fact, our last budget in October uh, provided additional funding, $13.5 million over three years from 2022-23, in additional funding to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, legal services to provide culturally appropriate legal assistance for coronial processes, and $1 million over three years from 2022-23 to build capacity and support leadership uh, of the peak body uh, for those legal services. But we recognise that there, are, there are, remain serious issues here, and it has been concerning to hear about service delivery freezes and closures across some of these legal services. Uh, and perhaps I can provide a bit more information about what we're doing on that front following your next question. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. Thank you for your response, Minister. The government claims to be closing the gap, but incarceration rates are going up. Without legal support, it is certain many more of our people will be locked up. Why does your government want to lock more of our people up, which will inevitably lead to more deaths in custody? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, Senator Thorpe. And I think that is an unfair uh, suggestion to make of the government, a government that is deeply committed to reducing Indigenous incarceration uh, and deeply committed to closing the gap, including uh, making sure that we have a voice to parliament to allow and pr permit, uh, provide uh, First Nations people with an opportunity uh, to provide their views to this parliament about these matters. Now, as I've said, uh, the Attorney General has been meeting with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services for some time. And in those meetings, he's heard directly about the positive impact that those legal services can have on Aboriginal people's lives, their families and communities. As I say, we have been concerned to hear about service delivery freezes and closures across these services. 
and we understand that funding for the services must match the high demand for services, both legal and non-legal. That's why we've commenced an independent review of the National Legal Assistance Partnership, which provides the bulk of these legal services funding. That will start shortly and be completed by the end Thank of the you, year. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Thanks, President. The budget contains some funding for family violence prevention services for First Nations survivors of family, domestic and sexual violence. Minister, how much of this funding will actually go to Aboriginal legal services? Thank you, and Senator. I did give you the heads up on this one. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I wasn't going to reveal that you'd given us the heads up, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but thank you for doing so. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with a, uh, a decent answer, and I invite the opposition to give us a heads up about any questions as well so that we can provide you with full and frank advice as well. Um, that, look, these are serious issues, obviously, Senator Thorpe, and uh, as I was saying, um, on the legal services matter, uh, a review of the funding arrangements will start shortly and be completed by the end of the year. That will include an assessment of unmet legal need and demand for disadvantaged groups across regional, rural and remote Australia. And I have no doubt that it will look at some of the issues that you have been raising, including in relation to family and domestic violence. The review will also specifically look at options for alternative funding arrangements for these legal services. The Attorney-General's Department is working closely with states and territories to support the continued provision of frontline services to First Nations people, uh, and I know the Attorney-General is personally Minister, committed to this. Resume your seat. Sen uh, Senator Thorpe. Thanks, President. The question was how much of the family violence money goes to Aboriginal legal services. That was announced last night. Uh, so how much of that is going to Aboriginal legal services? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I'll direct the minister to that part of your question. Minister. Um, I'm, I'm happy to come back on notice with the specific answer to that question, but uh, the Family Violence Prevention Legal Services uh, in the Northern Territory also provide an important role, and we want to make Thank sure you, that Minister they're adequately Watt, The time for uh, answering has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. I'm, I'm really excited to be asking my question today. Really excited. And I'm excited because I'm the first senator to ask the Minister for Agriculture about question on Australia's agriculture industry. Minister, I've learned that Australia has never had sustainable and predictable biosecurity funding. And last night's budget marked a historic moment for Australia's agriculture Order. industry, Order. with the Albanese government delivering— uh, Senator Coney, please resume your seat. Order on my left. I can barely hear the question. Minister, uh, Senator Ciccone, please continue. That's all right, President. Thank you. The excitement. Uh, I can't hold myself. But as I was saying, last night the Albanese Labor government marked a historic moment. It was the first time that the government is investing in our agriculture industry, delivering sustainable funding for biosecurity. So, Minister, could you please explain to the Senate how the budget delivers on the government's election commitment to provide sustainable long-term funding to biosecurity to protect our $90 billion agriculture, fisheries and forestry industries. I thank you, Senator Giacconi. Minister Watt. Well, Senator Giacconi, the only thing that I think tops the level of excitement you've got in asking that question is my excitement in answering this question. And it is good to get a question from a senator about agriculture. It would appear the National Party have completely vacated the field. Well, this morning a new, dawn, dawn, a new era dawned for Australian agriculture. For the first time ever, Australia has a sustainable biosecurity funding model. This will be a lasting Labor legacy of the Albanese government in the agriculture, fisheries and forestry portfolio, something that not one, not two, not three or recycled agriculture ministers from the National Party was ever able to achieve. The Albanese government is locking in higher, ongoing and more predictable biosecurity funding from year to year. Order. We have drawn a line under years of stopgap temporary funding from coalition governments that put our agriculture industry at risk. This decision of the Albanese government in last night's budget will result in more than $1 billion of additional funding for biosecurity, including $845 million to support biosecurity operations across the country, protecting our valuable agricultural industries. And isn't it good that at last we've got a Labor government standing up for our agricultural sector and biosecurity, rather than the mess we inherited from the other side? Now, in how will we pay for this? This is a good question. Importers will contribute about 48 per cent of the total cost 
through their clearance costs, with increased fees and charges expected to take their total contribution to biosecurity costs to almost $390 million from next year. And this includes expanded cost recovery to include the biosecurity clearance costs of parcels and non-letter mail. Now we know that the other side didn't want to pass on the cost of these services to industry, and that's why they were on the verge of bankrupting the Department of Agriculture and Wilty until we took charge. Taxpayers will contribute about 44 per cent of the total funding, about $350 million, and we'll also introduce a modest new biosecurity protection levy on agricultural uh, producers, you, which will see them contribute 6 per cent. Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President. Minister, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, as we know, sadly, that this government had to fund the department, uh, otherwise it would have been defunded. But could you please um, explain to the Senate why is it important that all beneficiaries of a strong biosecurity system need to contribute to funding the certainty for that system in order to make sure that our farmers have certainty in the long term? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. I'd, I'd be delighted to do so. Now, as I say, biosecurity is a shared responsibility, and what that means under our new, new funding system is that importers will contribute about 48 per cent of the total cost of biosecurity, uh, taxpayers will contribute about 44 per cent, with producers being asked to pay a modest 6 per cent of the cost of biosecurity protections that will stop them from having devastating diseases that will destroy their crops and destroy their livelihoods. Now, as we know, we are not the only people who think that biosecurity is a shared responsibility. And I note that this view attracted support in the consultation process we undertook last year. The Cattle Council of Australia, as it was known at the time, said that biosecurity is a shared responsibility and for our biosecurity measures to be most effective, all parties must contribute. In fact, the National Farmers Federation said that biosecurity is a shared responsibility and, as such, all biosecurity beneficiaries, including the community, the economy at large, the agricultural sector and the environment, should invest in biosecurity activities. Thank we you, will Minister finally Watt. have sustainable biosecurity funding. Thank you, President. Uh, it is great. Thank you, Senator Stirl. The Australian community and farmers benefit so much from our favourable biosecurity status. Minister, what are the benefits for our agriculture, fisheries and forestry industries of a sustainable funding model? Minister Watt. Thank you again, Senator Giacconi. Well, our landmark sustainable funding model for biosecurity will provide certainty and security for the Australian agricultural industry. It is a landmark and it is historic because it never happened once under the 10 years of coalition government. But you don't have to take my word for it. Today I see the Australian Food and Produce Alliance have said that the additional funding is welcome and will strengthen Australia's biosecurity to help ensure our nation is better protected. In contrast, the Liberal and National parties had nine long years but did not nothing to secure permanent, sustainable, long-term funding for biosecurity. But their incompetence on these matters went beyond that. A conga line of incompetent and economically illiterate National Party agricultural ministers left us with funding cliffs in vital frontline areas that would have Order. seen biosecurity funding fall by nearly 20 per cent this year if we hadn't acted. They failed to maintain the integrity of cost recovery. They said they'd introduce a container levy. They backed down under pressure, and then they went out to send out the department to explain it. And let's Sister. not forget about Ruby Princess and all the other biosecurity uh, disasters you, under that lot. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cash. Uh, you. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Minister, middle-class families with surging mortgage payments, surging grocery bills and energy costs have little to celebrate in last night's budget. Labor's budget confirms cost of living continues to go up, gas and electricity bills continue to skyrocket, real wages have not grown, inflation remains stubbornly high, unemployment will rise and Australians will pay higher taxes. Given that under Labor's budget a family with kids will be around $25,000 worse off, why is Labor making life harder for middle class Australians? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I thank the, uh, Senator Cash for the question, and I reject. Uh, I, I completely reject the numbers that she has outlined. Uh, Minister, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Stirl and Senator Cash, interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I think. I think the. Um, I think the opposition has had to dust off their dodgy calculator that they used to put budgets together in the past. 
to come up with this set of numbers that they keep shouting across the chamber. This budget is a very strong budget for all Australians, for all Australians, and we don't seek to divide as you do. We don't seek Senator to carve Cash. up the country in a series of demographics and different Senator age Coon. groups and different income groups. We make decisions on what is right for the country based on the economic circumstances of the time. That is why the cost of living package is targeted. But here are some things in the budget that you didn't take into account. Fastest wage growth since 2009, real wages growing, historic boost for wages for aged Order. care workers. How about that? What about the low unemployment? More people earning more in more uh, Minister, jobs. Minister Gallagher, please jobs. resume your seat. Minister, please resume your seat. Minister, Minister, please resume your seat. Order, Senator Wong. Again, particularly the interjections and the disorder on my left but and on my right is disorderly. The minister is entitled to answer, to have her answers heard in silence. I would ask the interjections cease. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Building more homes. What about that? What about what about some of the build to rent? What about the programs that we're doing there? For the first time in a decade, the Commonwealth engaged on housing Minister policy. Gala Shock Minister horror. Gallagher, please resume your seat. I've just called the chamber to order, and the minute the minister got onto her feet again, the disorder continued. I, Senator Rustin, Minister Gallagher, please continue. <laughs> Minister, I'm not a true goal order. Order. <laughs> Please continue. Rustin. No, Katie. Minister Gallagher, no. I've, I've asked you to yeah. continue. Order. Order. Minister Gallagher, I've invited you twice to continue. Uh, thank you very much. The work that we put in place caps on the uh, putting caps in, on energy prices that you voted against. Look at what that says in the budget paper. A 25 per cent reduction in what people will spend on their energy bills, on their electricity bills, Order. and you voted against Order. it. What about the jobs to be generated in the energy transition, net zero economy, the investments we're making uh, to drive those opportunities? Uh, what about Gallagher. them? You voted no Minister to those Gallagher, as well. Please. Order again. There are many opportunities across this week for senators to have a say on the budget or any other matter. Question time is not one of them, unless you are one of the people that's asking the question. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. We'll have our investments in childcare start on the 1st of July, again helping households across Australia. There are a number of measures in this budget Thank you, that are targeted to help middle Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you. On the Today Show this morning, Corey from Perth, a mortgage holder with a family, had this message for the Prime Minister regarding last night's budget. The government's not listening. They're not caring. They don't. And this budget proves that they don't care if you work. We're just going to slog you harder, and that's the way they want it. Again. Given that under Labor's budget, a family with kids will be around $25,000 worse, why is Labor making it harder for Australians like Corey? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Uh, well, I haven't had the opportunity to speak with Corey, and I didn't, I didn't hear what he said on the Today Show. Uh, but I am happy to go through, as I have in the previous answer, our investments in childcare will go and help people on middle incomes. In fact, I think we've been criticised by the fact that it's going to people on what you see as two higher incomes. Our investments in TAFE, our investments in the new, uh, the net zero economy, all of those driving jobs, putting the budget Order. on a more sustainable uh, footing, borrowing please. less Minister. debt, paying less. Minister, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Minister Gallagher, please continue. The extensions to paid parental leave. I could go on. The energy efficiency fund that's going to be established under Jenny McAllister's leadership. Uh, Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Minister Wong. It's a robust contest, but this answer has not yet had any period without interjections. 
Not one. Oh, I've left it a long time. I am. We- I have left it a long time. I would ask you order. to call them to order. order. And again. Order. And again. There is. Sorry, Mum. This uh, is Senator what you're going to treat women. Senator really. Rustin. Sorry, Mum. Order. Order on my left. Senator McGrath. Order. Order. Senators Cash, McGrath. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order across the chamber. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator McKenzie. Senator Wong. Sen- Senator Cash. Order on my left. Order. Order. Senator Stirl. <laughs> Senator Rustin, I am going to ask you to withdraw. To the chamber, I withdraw. Thank you. The chamber has been disorderly. I appreciate people have questions to ask. Minister Senator Wong, but when a question is asked, we are all entitled to hear the answer. And I'm asking for order in this chamber to be respectful of one another. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. So, uh, President, on wages growth, on jobs growth, on uh, the budget repair strategy that we've put in place to ensure that we're borrowing less money and paying less interest on that, mon- on that debt is all part of the approach that we've taken to this budget. That benefits all Australians. The tripling the bulk billing rate benefits all Australians, making Thank sure you, the Minister, investments the in Medicare work for everybody. Expired. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Sydney Radio this morning, another working Australian, had this message regarding Labor's budget. So once again, the workers who carry this country get screwed over. My wages have been going in one direction, backwards. Jim Chalmers has no clue of the day-to-day reality. We're under the pump, we work, we pay full taxes and we get nothing. Again. Order. Just a moment, Senator Birmingham. I will come back to you. I want to deal with other things first. Senator McKenzie, you were out of order. Senator Birmingham. President, a point of order in relation to interjections. You just had (laughs) Senator Wong, in answer to the previous question or during the previous answer, uh, provide a commentary of concern about continuous interjections. We've seen nothing but continuous interjections during the bulk of the 23 seconds that Senator Cash has been attempting to ask this question, coming directly from Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Birmingham, order. I am more than willing to pull up individual senators for their behaviour, and you would have heard that I did call Senator Wong to order before you, you stood. I appreciate your point of order, but I would reiterate that there have been many interjections today, many points of disorder. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. That I would reiterate there have been many interjections today from a range of senators. I take the point on Senator Wong. I called Senator Wong to order. I would expect, when Senator Cash finishes her question, that all senators in this place will listen to the answer in respectful silence. Senator Cash, I'm going to ask you to start your question again, and I don't want to hear any interjections. Senator Cash. On Sydney Radio this morning, another working Australian had this message regarding Labor's budget. So once again, the workers who carry this country get screwed over. My wages have been going in one direction, backwards. Jim Chalmers has no clue of the day-to-day reality. We're under the pump, we work, we pay full taxes and get nothing. Again, why is Labor making life harder for middle-class Australians? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't accept uh, that question at all. Um, I, don't, I don't accept it, and I think if people see the budget in its entirety— uh, Senator Gallagher, please resume your question. Why resume you let Goldilocks seat? answer? I have just asked the Senate to listen in respectful silence. 
Senator Cash was able to ask her question in respectful silence. I am now asking all of you in here to listen to the answer, whether you agree with it or not, to listen to it in respectful silence. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. And, and, uh, Senator Cash's question included a reference uh, to uh, the young man's uh, wages and how he had been feeling the pinch on wages. We agree. That's why the industrial relations changes we put through this parliament, more jobs, better pay. You opposed it. You opposed it. You opposed improvements to the industrial relations system that would allow workers to get a better crack at wage opportunities through the bargaining system. You have opposed our position on arguing for wages growth on the minimum wage through our minimum wage cases. You didn't make the commitment to fund the aged care workers' wage claim—15 per cent in this budget, found room for it, on top of all the other things we had to do. We are absolutely determined to get wages moving, and this budget shows that they are, they, we will have real wages growth Thank faster you, than had the previously been expected. Senator Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. In uh, question time on 28 March 2023, I took question 